what he decided to do was donate computers, laptops to some of the secretaries of the high up officials within the government. And on these computers, he had keystroke logging information. The FBI wants the master code to all Apple iPhones. Uh, and if it gets that, the next thing they'll be doing is knocking on Google's store. And Google has 95% of the world market for smartphones. So then from him being detained because they thought his passport was stolen, it then became him being held for extradition to America. For what reason? How stupid would it be? He's my neighbor. Liberty means that our bodies and our minds belong to ourselves. In the documentary, it kind of makes out that John had a dispute with his neighbor over, was it walking the dogs on the beach? With his antivirus, his first customers were, you know, the government, CIA, FBI. Liberty is lost when governments decide what is right or wrong. But if you believe that Google is not harmful, then you must believe that the total loss of our privacy and human dignity is not harmful. Janice, how are you, my friend? I'm doing good, Chris. How are you? Yes, I'm great. Thank you. I don't want to say too great because I know that you've been through an awful, awful lot, Janice. And, and um, I'm, I empathize with that. And also your, your plight of trying to bring some justice for John. I'll just, uh, fr friends at home, Janice was the wife of John McAfee, an absolutely fascinating gentleman. Um, who was the subject of a recent documentary on Netflix, Running with the Devil, The Wild World of John McAfee. I watched it glued to the screen. There's a lot of parallels with my life. Um, can we say the partying? <laughs> That's a euphemism, the partying aspect. Um, I also, whenever anyone asks me, Chris, where would you want to live on the planet? Apart from saying I'll be happy being anywhere, I always say Belize because it's just an incredible... John lived there, Jan Janice, didn't he, when all the sort of trouble trouble kicked Sorry. off? Yeah, he did. Um, so he was he was living there before 2012, but um, I'm most familiar with his story um, once um, he got into a battle with the Belizean government. So I'll, I will just quickly go through that because I think it's important to his story because... Um, a lot of his his issues with the Belizean government started well before his neighbor was murdered. And so um, I believe it was about April of 2012 when he said he was visited by some representatives of the Belizean go government who um, who asked him if he was willing to donate uh, two million dollars to um, a campaign or just to the to uh, these officials and they would dole it out to whomever. But um, the specifics weren't given of who, I guess they were asking the money for, but they said, you know, they would give him perks around the island, you know, land, women, um, you know, whatever it was that he wanted uh, for this donation. And he declined. And he said about a week later, um, his property was raided by the GSU, which is the gang, gang suppression unit. And um, they destroyed his laboratory. So he had a, um, he was actually working on a topical antivirus, which is pretty cool in keeping with, you know, his antivirus that he created for computers. He was working on a topical antivirus because in the jungle, um, you know, you were getting bit up by lots of different uh, insects and things. So actually, when I met him, he had all of these scars from bite marks. Um, and so that was what his um, topical antivirus was going to address. And he had actually had samples already that he was giving to some of the locals and they were using it. And they said it worked really, really good. But um, when his lab got destroyed, that kind of destroyed that uh, that project. And um and they ended up arresting him for, they said he, he had a gun that wasn't um, 
registered that he didn't have a license for, but then he was able to produce the license. So they let him go drop that charge. And then about a week or so after the raid on his property, he said those same representatives came back to him and said if he had, and asked him if he had changed his mind about his donation. And, you know, obviously you told him to get the F off my property. And so he said from there that started the war, I guess, if you will, with the government, because he went on a mission to try to uh, find evidence that they set him up for the raid because he wanted an apology. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he was really passionate about the topical antivirus and and um, to have gotten so close to possibly, you know, mass production obviously would have been a great frustration. And so um, what he decided to do was donate computers, laptops to some of the secretaries of the high up officials within the government. And on these computers, he had keystroke logging information. So um, obviously a way for him to get into their systems through these laptops. And so instead of him finding evidence of this um, the spray that they set him up for, he instead found out evidence of, of drug trafficking, human trafficking, uh, money laundering, uh, murder for hire, all sorts of illegal activities that were being um, um, handled or done by, by some of these top officials. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when he found out that information, Obviously, he knew he had a, a little bit of a bigger problem, you know, if they would have found out. But that's what exactly what happened. They found out because he had women that were that were OK in the collection of the information. Now, all, all of this, I'm telling you, as he told me. So um, I don't have firsthand knowledge of this, but this is what he explained to me. And so um, and he's also spoken about it n numerous times. But so he had women that were going through the information to find out things relevant to John. And so um, one of the women was actually sleeping with someone within the police department. And they were just chatting, you know, after, you know, kind of pillow talk or whatever. And she shared with him what she was doing for John. And that's how they found out. And that's when he had to go on the run within Belize. Um, during the whole summer leading up to the murder of his neighbor. And so he had a property on San Pedro Island and he would bounce between his properties, you know, kind of hiding out because he would get word that there was, you know, um, an attack coming or they were, they were going to try to come and collect him. So he was, um, he was already on the run before his neighbor was murdered. And, um, what he explained to me about the murder of his neighbor is that he felt like it was a botched hit, um, like the, that um, someone was sent to murder him, but they went to the wrong house and they got the wrong American because they did live, they lived next to each other, but obviously on the beach, you know, there was obviously some miles between their homes, but their homes were, you know, next to each other. Um, and so that's what he believed happened was the botch murder. And then obviously we know everything that happened uh, after that, him being deported from, from Guatemala back to America. Was there any ever um, any ballistics done on the, on that weapon? Um, on what weapon are you referring to? Well, for friends at home, in the documentary, it kind of makes out that John had a dispute with his neighbour over was it walking the dogs on the beach? Or um, so the dispute the dispute was about the dogs. So John had. Um, for whatever reason, John, I mean, he, he loves animals and dogs, especially. And for whatever reason, dogs would kind of just gravitate to his property. So he said at one time he had like as many as 20 dogs, um, just just stray dogs, people's dogs that maybe they left on the island or or what have you. So he, you know, he took them in and, um, you know, he said it wasn't just uh, Mr. Fall that had an issue with with the dogs that everybody that came, you know, around the area had a problem with the dogs, obviously. Um, but he didn't realize, or I should say he didn't know about um, his neighbor filing any complaint at the time. He, did, he had no knowledge of that. Um, and so I, I don't think, um, I, I'm not sure what um, evidence might've been collected uh, 
in regards to what happened to Mr. Fall. But I do know that he was, John was never wanted for the murder. John was never suspected of murdering his neighbor. What they wanted him for was to question him about his whereabouts, where he was on the night of the murder. That's all. They never, they never suspected him. And, and this is, um, you know, anybody can do a Google search and you can find the news about about what actually the Belizean officials said about John in relation to uh, the murder of his neighbor. So um, obviously because of, as I explained to you, what happened with John and ha him collecting this information, he didn't want to be questioned by them because he felt that he would be in grave danger if he ever um, was collected by them. But he did offer... Um, numerous times to be questioned in a neutral country, in a neutral setting. He offered the Belizean officials to even come to America soon after he was deported to come and question him if, he, if they wanted, um, just to find out where he was. And, and I'm not sure why why the, the case is stalled out. You know, I'm, I'm sure that there's lots of evidence or a way to figure out um, you know, ballistics on the, on the guns and all of that stuff. But obviously, um, I don't think it, it I don't think um, they had anything where they could go after John. You know, like I said, they just wanted him for questioning and um, there was no reason for them to go after him for anything more. Janice, so we'll come on and talk about John's, um, can we say, wild lifestyle. But just to get to the sort of crux of the issue for our friends watching and listening, John was in a Spanish jail where he went to Spain thinking, you know, he'd be safe, was arrested, placed in jail, and then um, America got an extradition warrant. And then was it a couple of days later, John turned uh, up de uh, dead in his cell? No, he was actually, he had been in prison for nine months. So he was in the Spanish prison, prison for nine months. And what happened was... Um, we had been living in Spain, no problem. We had been, you know, been traveling all over Europe, um, no problem. We had actually flew to Germany um, just before his arrest. And I'm mentioning this because it's important to the story. So we flew to Germany, he gave his passport, everything was fine. There was no flag on his passport. They didn't detain him for anything. Um, we actually had to get turned back around though because the COVID restrictions were, um, put back into place by the time we had landed. So we weren't able to stay there. So we came, we flew back to Spain through the Barcelona airport. So fast forward to October when John was arrested, he was flying, going to be flying to Turkey. And all of a sudden now his passport, he said, was flagged as stolen. And so that's why they detained him. And then it was the next day that then this warrant came up and, and all of a sudden now he had this warrant. Um, that was issued to Interpol. And so that, so then from him being detained because they thought his passport was stolen, it then became him being held for extradition to America. And as I said, he had been there for nine months. Um, we had attorneys, he had five different attorneys, two uh, American attorneys, um, two Spanish attorneys and a, and a UK attorney because he has dual citizenship. And, um, we all understood that John was going to, that they were going to grant the extradition. This was an understanding that we all knew um, that obviously that's what they were going to do. However, we also knew that that didn't mean that John was going to be extradited the next day, the next week, the next month or year. You know, there's going to be a time, a process before that would happen. Um, and we also had planned in place for appeals and, and how to move forward from that. Okay, so there was no desperation from John, like, oh, this is it. I just have to end it all. There was there was no feeling of that, even on the day, because I spoke to him every day while he was in prison. Um, he got three calls a day. Um, they were eight minutes apiece. So we spoke. We spoke twice that day. And um, we spoke in the morning before he went to court. And we spoke in the afternoon after he came back from court and he was obviously disappointed with their decision. But as I said, it was not a surprise. Um, and the last thing he said to me was, I love you and I'll call you later. So, you know, our conversation was pretty standard, pretty normal. There was nothing, um, you know, I'd been with John for years, you know, so I, I, I would have been able to notice if there was a shift in his energy or, or if there would have been a need for concern that maybe he might, 
uh, want to do something to himself because because of this decision. But that wasn't the case at all. So um, I'm um, so after our last call, I what I would do sometimes was collect um, news headlines of the day so that I could read them to him and just share, you know, the news. So just to kind of keep him up to date with what was happening in the world. So I was doing that and I was on Twitter and someone sent me a DM and said, Oh my God, tell me it isn't true. And um, so then I, I just assumed that it had to be something about John and I Googled and then I found out that he was, he had allegedly um, killed himself. And so that's how I found out which is just terrible. No one should have to find out news of their loved one that way. You know, um, the prison could have very easily called the attorney. They even could have called my number. My number was on file. Um, and, um, and, and I, you know, in John's prison file, I'm listed as his wife. So that's who I was to him. And that's who they knew me as to him. So they, I'm just saying they could have called me, you know, as opposed to just letting this be news and, 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 why they would announce it that way before even having a cause of death. You know, that's, I think it, that was very irresponsible as well. Like you, you can't have a cause of death without the autopsy report and they couldn't have done the autopsy, you know, that quickly. So why, why even allow that to be reported in that way? You know. And also in John's case, such a, such ho high profile stuff going on, there should be an investigation. Right. And they, they actually opened the prison, actually opened the, the investigation mm -hmm. into um, his death. They opened it. And um, so from some from their report, they um, it stated that John was not dead when they found him, which is something that was misreported. He was not found dead in his cell. He was alive. He had a pulse. Um, it was a weak pulse, but he had one. And so um, my, my desire or what I want from the... Why, why I want the autopsy report is because I want to understand what happened from the time that they found him alive in his cell to the time that they pronounced him dead because the police report or their investigative report doesn't give any detail into that. Um, and so that's, that's what I want to know. I'm not, I'm not trying to dispute what their autopsy says. I just want to know what it says. And um, from what I understand, it's not, it's not standard procedure for them to give the autopsy report when someone dies. However, when it's requested, it's given. And so I've requested it and I don't understand why they are not willing to give it to me. Have you had any information from any other sources, say, for example, from prisoners to, to give any indication of, of an alternative narrative? Um, no, no. So John was actually moved to prison and, um, uh, one of the from the so from the first prison, I obviously was able to speak to uh, uh, one of the inmates that he sell he he bunked with, if you will, and um, you know he he alluded to maybe there was some mistreatment of John while he was in there, but he didn't say exactly what, um, and and who from whom you know, but but he just alluded to that, and I'm not sure. Um, you know, I've I never really got the details on that. And so, but once he was moved, I, I didn't have that um, sort of opportunity. I haven't heard anything from anyone. Um, he obviously had, a, when he was moved, he obviously had a, a bunk mate as well. But even in the report, the, their, the prison's investigative report, there's no mention of this cellmate or, or what his, um, or his statement as to what, uh, because he was the last person to see John alive. So there's no statement from him. There's no statement from the guards that spoke to him that day. There's no statements from any of the other inmates that spoke to him that day. Because in the police report, um, I was so I was able to be shown footage from the cameras because there was a camera that was facing towards John's sale. So I was able to be shown footage of them finding John, you know, the everything they went through after finding him. Um, but throughout the day, I wasn't able to see any footage. However, in the report, there are still shots from the surveillance camera of people um, in the hallway talking to John. And, you know, John's like standing in, in the doorway of his cell or standing in the hallway near his cell. And guards are, you know, photographed. 
talking to him. So there's there's all of this movement around his cell, but there's no discussion of of what was going on or what you know what was going on with John from that in the in the report. I will say when I was able to go to the the prison, they allowed me to come and and pick up his belongings. Um, the I guess the head of the guards, the, the the boss, I guess of the guards, he was there and he. And he um, was speaking very highly of John and he said, you know, everybody, you know, liked him and respected him. And, and John was a, basically he was just saying he was a, an exemplary inmate, if you will. That's, you know, he, he didn't cause any problems. He was always upbeat. He was always talking with people and joking. And so he was saying that even on that day, he still was behaving the same way. So, the, so there was no change in his behavior after he came back from this um, hearing you know, where they granted the extradition. So there was no change in his behavior. They, this is what he, you know, wanted me to understand about, about John that day. And, and everybody was shocked, you know, at what happened. And, and so that's, you know, just, there's just a lot of questions. And I feel like the autopsy report can answer those questions. And I just, again, I don't understand why they're not willing to give me that report. So, it's fair to say, Janice, isn't it, that John, there's a couple of things going on here. The first thing is, I'm pretty sure I saw him on a video online saying, I am not suicidal and I would never take my, my life. Am, am I correct? Um, it may not have been a, tw uh, a video, but it was definitely a tweet. Yeah. I I, I, tweet. He got the tattoo, um, the whacked tattoo on his arm. Um. Yeah, it was definitely a concern. Now, this was before he was in prison, and I think maybe he might have tweeted something again when he when he was actually in prison. I think something that alluded to the fact of if he was um, if he was found in a similar way that Jeffrey Epstein was found. Yeah. Um, it was not it was not due to his own hand. Basically, was what he alluded to um, when he was in prison, and so I can say that in my speaking to him, he never. Um, I think there was just only one incident that he told me of where someone tried to get in his face, you know, aggressively just try to, you know, kind of, um, I don't know, just be aggressive with him. They, they didn't try to, you know, physically harm him, but they just kind of got in his face. And he said one of the other inmates, bigger inmate came and got in between and kind of told that guy, you know, we don't do that here, something like that. And, and he never had another issue, but, um, Again, it's possible that John wasn't telling me everything because obviously he wouldn't want me to worry. Um, but from what he told me, he didn't have issues um, with the guards or the other inmates. The other inmates were kind of um, protective over him somewhat because here in Spain, you know, they have a, a, high, risk, a high regard for their elderly pop population. And um, a lot of the inmates were surprised that he was in what is called general population which is where you're just with everybody, you know, you're not isolated. You're, so he didn't have, um, you know, a special wing of the prison. You know, he was with everybody, you know, all of the, the, the criminals. He was, I mean, obviously he was there with the, the murderers, the rapists, the drug traffickers, human traffickers, all of that. He was in, you know, in that same environment. And so um, it wasn't his first time being in, in a foreign prison, you know, it, it had happened before it was the course of his life. So he knew how to handle himself. And, and again, I just, he never told me of any altercations other than that one thing. And so I, I'm, I don't, I don't know if there was something more happening to understand it, what might've actually occurred that day. So Janice, is it a possibility that John had information on people through his, through his backdoor software, like the keystroke? software definitely um so just even from you know i know a lot of people have suggested that something with his antivirus i, I can't speak to that so i don't know you know if there was a way for him to get that information but i will say this his with his antivirus his first customers were you know the government cia fbi um the military even so those were his first customers and and obviously he would have had knowledge of of things um, uh, things that most the average person wouldn't have been able to have knowledge of. But um, regarding the situation in Belize, I do believe that um, 
because it's the Caribbean and a lot of Americans, a lot of wealthy Americans and a lot of just wealthy people, period. You know, they um, they move their money through the Caribbean. You know, they have, you know, accounts in the Caribbean, obviously secret you know, money, maybe money that was gained through illegal activities. And so I think this is kind of common knowledge. Um, so obviously he would have gotten information on all of that, you know, on, on all of that, who those players were. And, and, and that was a, a big concern for him. I know um, even just coming back to America because that issue followed him into America because the Sinaloa cartel, um, they operate in America and it was his belief that they were kind of hired out to cause him problems once he got back to America. So, so his issues with police kind of continued there. At, at least that's what he understood the, the problem to be. And obviously he would have had that knowledge. Um, John was a very wealthy man at one point in time. And not only that, he was the creator of the antivirus. And if you know anything about antivirus, it helps to stop hackers from hacking into your system, which means, therefore, you have to be able to hack. You know, you have to know how hackers work and how they operate in order to create something that prevents them from um, hacking into systems. So he knows how to do that. And obviously, he's going to make sure that his um, his safety was paramount, you know, um, and he didn't have a uh, security team that he hired, meaning like a professional sort of um, like the Brinks team, I think is what they're called for, you know, like other celebrities do. They, they hire out people to protect them. That wasn't John's way. He protected himself and he would hire, you know, ex-military people to, to be a part of that protection team. In Belize, it was different. You know, he didn't have the ex-military, but he had um, obviously some of the darker characters of, of the area who were native to the area, because obviously you would want someone native to the area who could protect you from, you know, possible dangers. So he, he always took his protection into his own hands. And that's what he did. So he always made sure to know any information that could possibly um of, of any possibly planned attacks or, or people planning on on putting people in his life or, or trying to do him harm. He always had knowledge of that and always protected himself accordingly. How do you feel that the Netflix documentary was received and, and was it accurate and, and how did you feel about it? I think it was very, very well received just because it just gives, um, you know, there's just a lot more footage of John and, um, Obviously, it was very entertaining. I, you know, I didn't, I didn't really care too much for it because it's just the same. Only because it's the same storytelling. You know, there's no, no one really digs into John's John's perspective. You know, everyone just kind of sticks on the surface level of all oh, this crazy, paranoid, drunkard. You know, he's already always partying, women, drugs, guns. And, you know, and, and I just feel like that story has been told, you know, over and over and over again. You know, and, and I just would have liked to have seen someone tell the story from John's perspective. You know, that way you could get a full picture of what was actually happening in his life, you know. Um, but uh, it was entertaining. It was good to see him, you know, again, obviously. Um, but overall, I guess it, I guess it did, I guess it accomplished what, what they set out to do, which was for it to be entertaining and, and to get people talking. I do, I don't like the idea of them, you know, that little last bit at the end where they tried to suggest that maybe he was alive and with uh, his ex-girlfriend talking about she got a phone call from him, you know, um, I don't think they needed that clickbait, you know, to try to get people excited and talking about it and wanting to watch it. I think John's just an exciting topic and, and people will watch anything related to him. And so I, you know, but uh, yeah, overall, I guess it, it was a okay. Do you think she was just trying to sort of get another five minutes of fame or, you know, I, I can't speak to her motivations. Um, I, I don't know. You know I don't no, know it's we shouldn't we shouldn't talk about other people like that, should we? It was just a <laughs> no, but it's a good it question was, though to understand why. You know, but I, I I sincerely I don't know why she would have suggested that he's alive somewhere. You know, obviously that adds adds fuel to this. You know, kind of um, mysterious. Is he dead? Is he not dead? You know, did he get away? 
you know, is this just an all an act? Is he going to come out and reveal himself at some later time? You know, because that, that was Sean. Obviously, there was reports of him faking a heart attack in, in Belize or Guatemala, I should say, to um, to kind of stay the, the extradition from uh, Guatemala back to Belize. So he did do that. And so it's I guess it's it's not unreasonable to think for for people to think that maybe he could have faked his death. But um, I will just say that when I when I was asked to uh, identify his remains, I'm certain it was him. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. And did we understand John? John had been subject to childhood trauma. Was um, yeah, he in, um, intergenerational kind of stuff? Yes. Yeah, so his his um, father was obviously um, he was an alcoholic, and he he would abuse both John and his mother um, really badly, like hospital stays. You know, broken bones. You know, black eyes. Um, broken bones on both he and his mother. So, um, yeah, it was a very violent um, sort of up, upbringing. And um, but not only not only that he he had this. Um, what can I say? I guess it, in, in that it bred in him a, a desire to to always want to make sure that he was never poor again. I guess maybe that's a good way to say that because he was born obviously just after our World War World War. World War Two, sorry, <laughs> and um, so obviously food was scarce, money was scarce, and his mother, he and his mother, you know, they kind of were they were living in the UK, and um, she was trying to get to America to be with John's dad because he was a, a soldier, and that's how John came to be because um, she was actually um, married already, but she was having an affair with John's dad, and so anyways they they were able to finally come to America when he was two years old. And, and so he grew up in the Appalachian mountains where kind of, that was kind of the poor area of the country during that time as well. And so he, he had this really strong work, work ethic and he, and he, um, I think his first business was cutting grass, mowing lawns. And so he would hire out, you know, the, he would go around to the neighborhood homes and, and, you know, offer to uh, mow their lawn. And then he would get, you know, some of the boys or his friends in the neighborhood and he would um, hire them out to do the jobs. And then obviously he took percentage of that. And from that, he was selling magazines. And so he always was working, you know, really hard. Um, that's something that he was very proud of, you know, that his money, the money, his success came from his hard work, you know, from um, just, just trying to figure out how to, how to, how to, take care of himself, you know, as men do, you know, obviously. And um, even with the, the antivirus, you know, that was something that just happened, you know, across his lap. I think he said his um, brother-in-law had, uh, he had seen something, a, a newspaper story or something about the first um, uh, attack. I think it was called the, the Jerusalem. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm misremembering this. But anyways, it was this first, sort of attack on computer systems and he said just from reading that he, he could he figured out how oh okay well this is how they're doing that this is how it can be stopped and from there that birth you know this this antivirus so even though he came from a traumatic past you know he he didn't let it um he didn't let it stop him you know he, he actually used it as his fuel to propel him into a into a better life for himself and Janice that one of the memorable bits from the documentary for me was was the bit on the boat on the the big the big expensive yacht towards the end was it frightening at all it was it was definitely um you know there there obviously i guess i guess from people looking from the outside looking in it it does look crazy paranoid and all that stuff and maybe he was you know um and I think maybe he would have admitted that as well. However, there were people after him looking to do him harm. And so what was going on with the on the boat or during that situation was um, he had just closed his bank account in America and $500,000 in cash was brought to him from those closed accounts. So he's got all of this cash on him. So you can imagine <laughs> people are like literally probably, you know, salivating at the mouth at, you know, oh, we're going to get this big payday, you know? Um, 
so so naturally he goes into to protective mode or, or offensive mode you know now i'm going to i'm going to let it be known that that whatever ideas anybody may have it's not going to be so easy for you to try to come and get this money you know you're going to have problems so it was very intense during that time um and obviously probably scary for her for everyone else but um and as out of control as he looked it wasn't the case you know he was very much in control very much aware of, of what, what was happening um but there were obviously a lot of sleepless nights a lot of stress um and, and I think once people can understand, once people fully understand his story, then you can understand why, why things look so crazy and chaotic from the outside, you know? And Janice, what, what are you pushing for now? How can people help you? What, obviously you want the autopsy mm -hmm. results, but I, I get the impression you, you need, somebody with a bit of clout to help you well yes I'm, I'm just trying to get the word out now um just to kind of put some pressure on the courts if anybody knows <laughs> any spanish judges or any you know or they have no have any relationship with anyone you know within the spanish government that would be awesome if <laughs> you could reach out or or to me or to them or or just at the very least, just spread this this interview so people understand that most importantly, he wasn't dead when they found him. I think this is the biggest misreporting that happened there. He was not dead. He was alive. He had a pulse. And, and that is my desire for the autopsy report because I want to know, you know, what happened to him. And, um, and obviously I want his remains returned so that I can lay him to rest. You know, um, everybody deserves that. You know, this is not a situation where they don't have his body. They're just holding it. And um, so the, the appeal that I made for the autopsy report, I, I found out, you know, in the summer of last year that it would take six to eight months for them to come back with a decision. So the appeal was filed in February of last year. And, you know, six to eight months would have been October you know, at the, the eight month mark and we're sh sitting here in February of 2023 and then they're still not giving me a decision. And, you know, obviously his case is probably not the only case that this court has before them. But at the same time, though, there's there's just such a thing as human decency, you know, um, and, and this feels just a bit cruel in its nature you know it's difficult to not look at it that way you know for this to go on for so long when it's just a simple yes or no you know that's that's all that i'm asking for i'm not disputing what's in the autopsy i just want the report and and but if you're not going to give me the report then i would like the opportunity to have an independent autopsy performed so that i can know what happens but i'm and i'm just waiting on on that decision and and how people can help. Uh, there's a petition that you can sign. It's, you can go to releasemcafee.com and sign and share the petition and um, just help spread the word about what's happening because I think it's um, maybe justice is not something that I can get for John. That's fine. I'm, I'm okay with that. I can accept that. But I, what I want to try, you know, I want to try to get this information. Um, and again, I just don't see any good reason why they're not willing to give me this autopsy report. You know, if there's nothing to hide, as they've reported, you know, if there's this was just a standard suicide situation, then why not give me the autopsy report? You know, why make it difficult for me? Why try to stall me out, you know, and, and make me wait all this time for this report? And so... Um, so, yes, if we could just help me spread the word, that would be amazing. That would be very helpful. Um, outside of that, obviously, this is a situation that can only be handled within the court system. And, um, you know, I don't think petitioning or, or I mean, not petitioning, but um, protesting. I don't know if that would work. You know, um, maybe it might, but but I don't have the means to kind of organize that. So so this is my way of, of spreading the word, you know, online to try to get attention to the situation. Janice, we'll put all your links below the podcast, so don't worry about don't worry about that. Um, 
stay on the line so I can thank you properly. I've also got a, a couple of ideas we can discuss. I really hope the the time comes when you can get some closure on this and you're clearly a a, a beautiful soul. Thank you. And I I don't want you to be too sad for too for too long, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, because at some point we we know life's unfair. All we can do is fight the spiritual battle and, you know, put out that love for the next generation. So um, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. You're more than welcome. Uh, we should also say um, thank you to Nick, shouldn't we? For, yes, for, thank you, Nick. Thank you, Nick, for hooking us up. Friends at home, I hope you found this chat as fascinating as I have. If you could... Um, support janice if there's anybody out there you'll the links will be below to get in touch uh, if you could like and subscribe and click the notification bell that helps the podcast much love to you all